Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time, as Mr. Edwards has said as well, too. I'm Johnny Pham. I'm one of the instructors here at Cyber Warrior Academy, along with the wonderful Mr. Isaac, who is uh, one of the best uh, instructors, uh, teacher's assistants, and a future instructor as well, too, that I've ever worked with. And um, so uh, a little bit about myself before we kind of dive into the uh, topic for today. Um, I am a veteran. I still am uh, for US, United States Navy. Coincidentally, today's the Navy's birthday. So happy hoo-yah. Um, I have uh, 13 years with the Navy and still in the reserve as a supply officer. I work for a tech company, uh, actually a couple of tech companies um, as a procurement operations. And in my past, I did time as a, uh, a SEC analyst. So uh, I do love cybersecurity in this field. Um, I've been a procurement guy for many years. As soon as I stepped foot in the Navy, I was in a procurement guy and I got my degrees in procurement, uh, accounting and procurement. Um, the last couple of years, I knew that I needed to break out because I was very siloed in what I was doing. And also I wanted to make myself more valuable to my organizations or whatever organizations I was working at. Uh, now I did, you know, I went to get my security plus certified, certified ethical hacking, compliancy, certified network defense architect. And it helped me really bridges gap. I'm not selling you anything. I'm just telling you that you're making yourself invaluable by being here. So the first step, and I don't want to thank you for doing that, is being here in this to know what you want to see if this is something that you want to do. So again, uh, very appreciative of taking the time. Uh, questions, we can have breakout rooms later. Um, Mr. Isaac, if you want to introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll dive right into the topic for the day. But Mr. Isaac, uh, Take yes, sir. <laughs> so, hello, everybody. My name is Isaac. I'm um, one of the TA here uh, working South Warrior uh, with wonderful people like Johnny. Uh, because that guy, guys, he's just, he's just a legend. Um, but yeah, um, just here, you know, to kind of show you some things, uh, to show you the fun part after Johnny's done um, about the boot camp and about cybersecurity, too. So nice to meet you all. And yep, that's me. Thank you, Mr. Isaac. So what we're going to do, we're going to get into the topic for the day, social engineering. And as it says, the secret weapon of cyber criminals. It is the secret weapon because it is one of the main ways, if not one of the most favorable ways to get the information they need from you or the organization to get into what they want. At the end of the day, they're trying to get in wherever it may be, what systems, what um, passwords, whatever it may be to get those credentials to get what they want. It may be motivated by money, about 80% times it is, right? Ransomware, anything of that nature. But also it may be some political agenda. There is things called hacktivists that happen too. So don't uh, always think that it's relatable to only money or monetary um, uh, greed or anything of that nature. Sometimes it's other pieces. So some statistics that we're going to be looking at, right? 15 billion emails, make it spam emails, make it in your internet every day. I can't tell you. I mean, everybody's been a victim of it here. There's no way that you have not received one spam email that looks super suspicious, right? Looks like it's come from Bank of America or any banking institution that or that you've won a prize, Amazon is giving you a gift card, you've seen it, 15 billion, and it's growing every single day. 42% of workers have reported having taken a dangerous action while online, failing to, blow, to follow phishing prevention best practices. This, I wanna call out. This is actually more nowadays. Uh, my company that we went through recently, we had a 67% uh, we did a phishing exercise, 67% of the organization failed. 67%. That means that, that the attempt was really good, well, number one. But number two, even though the, the attempt was derived in, inside the organization, it was extremely good. <clears throat> and number two, that means that they're not reading. What happens in today's age, right? Time and everybody's in a rush. You're not looking at things. The granularity, the details, everything that we do is not what it used to be. Like you would look at, you glance at something, hit okay, or you'll delete, or you'll approve something, and then that's it. 
they're in. I know because I'm, I'm a hacker. I'm a certified ecto hacker. I know i those are my favorite targets, right? If I have somebody who's just careless, they'll click on it and it's done. And it'll, they'll get in the system. They'll harvest any credentials they need. 83% of organization reported experiencing phishing attacks. That's common, even more so nowadays. It's so super common. I can tell you in a day, I'll probably get in my work email alone, I'll get like 30 attempts. Some of them are weeded out. Some of them are like valid inquiries, but the sophistication behind these types of um, emails are becoming more prevalent. Uh, so it's hard to discern what's real and what's not. And 30% of uh, phishing emails are open. I'm going to tell you, like the example of my organization, 67% of those individuals in my organization of 1,300 people clicked on that email that was generated. And that was a third party that did it. We hired a third party that did it for us, and they caught 67% of our people out of 1,300, right? You can imagine the number. Crazy. So... What we're going to delve into in the next few slides, the introduction, what you can do to spot them, what you can do to avoid them. But at the end of the day, it's general awareness, right? We all have security training, whatever organization you're working in. But overall, if you don't have security training of where any organization you're working at, or if you're going to school, this is just guidelines to live your life by as well, too, because you're using the internet every day. Everybody has email. Everybody uses the internet. Everybody checks their bank account. Everybody goes into every application that's available on the web. So guidelines for life, but also guidelines for your organization as well, too, whatever it may be. So cyber criminals, they employ social engineering attacks or techniques. It's simple, right? It says, it says right here, frankly, it's frequently simpler to take advantage of your inherent tendency to trust others than is to figure out how to hack your program. If you have something that's familiar, you're going to click on it. Doesn't matter. It's just familiarity, right? You see a logo, you're going to do it. It's just one of those things that our minds are wired that way. Once you are repetitive in something, clicking on a Facebook link or if LinkedIn, let's say, right? If you're on LinkedIn, you're like, oh, somebody liked my post or had a comment on my post, and you click on it, and that link may be a hiding link that redirects your credentials somewhere else. And they have, now they have your credentials for LinkedIn or Facebook or, or Meta nowadays, right? Or uh, worse yet, they can get into your bank account, right? Because nowadays you have that application on your phone where, or anything, your phone or your laptop is um, multi-factor, right? Authic auth authing, meaning that it will just, sign in for you. And that's not a good thing because those, e those simple sign-ons which we call SSOs, single sign-on points, Okta or any of those um, type of where they can push your, uh, your uh, verification gives you, uh, gives the hacker an ability to steal your credentials. So social engineering, one of the main tools um, that Uber attacked was the social engineering tool. That was a 17-year-old using a company email to get credentials, literally. So a 17-year-old broke, broke into Uber. Social engineering, the term, describe a wide range of male malevolent uh, behaviors carried throughout interactions with other people. Users are duped into divulging critical information or committing security blunders via uh, psychological manipulation. It's, again, we fall into the realm of familiarity. If it's coming from your work, you're going to click on it, and boom, it's done, right? It's not an easy thing. Some things you can spot, like a logo issue or a misspelling or something of like that. But again, how often do you take, if you have a, a job that you have like 70 emails a day, let's just say that, how many times do you take at least two to three minutes at minimum, to read an email and see every part of it, right? Not often. I'm going to tell you that, you know, your job may be, uh, I'll tell you my job is to look at emails, discern what's, what's the action item, and then reply back or, or take the action item and move forward. But sometimes I'm going to admit to you, as you're going through, you're like, okay, I get it. No, you don't. 
one of the things that link on there is like, oh, okay, I'll click on this and request this application. That uh, request for application, as soon as it diverts you, that hacker put it in there and it diverts you to another um, portal and you start, start putting your credentials in there, boom, it's done. They captured your credentials, they use it to backdoor into any system and they get their way into the system. It's as easy as that. And that's the thing. They are preying upon uh, just the familiarity piece, but also it's like time, right? How does it work? Majority of social engineering attacks rely on direct communication with the targets. Personalization, right? As you can see from this graph, the hacker, that friendly face, familiarity, and look at that, right? This, though, is a cartoon, and it's like, oh, that's, that's too obvious. Really, it's not. When you're hiding behind the veil of email or anything else, you can't tell who's who, right? So again, due diligence. Rather than employing brute force to access your data, the attacker usually persuades the user to do so. The more they talk, the more they send, you either get like uh, fatigue from seeing the same email and you click on it finally and say, what's this? And then that's done, right? So always, I hate to say it, it was a, a really overused term, but keep your guard up, literally. Some types of uh, social engineering attacks, <clears throat> baiting, phishing, pretexting, scareware, piggybacking, and tele tailgating, quid pro quo. We're going to go through these in the next few slides, but baiting, just getting it just like how you like imagine fishing, right? It's to use that analogy, but it's the same thing. Little bites here and there, and then soon you're going to bite into the whole thing, and which is going to be something that they want you to click on. They might give you little things to, to like, oh, what are, what's going on here? It's, I'm getting something from the IRS. And it's like, ah, oh, no. And then you get it another day. And then you get it another day. And you go, I got to find out what this is. Phishing. Pushing uh, emails across as uh, true, but not really. Right? And then you're clicking on something as well. And there, there you go. Feed texting, same scenario. Text that you might get as well too. Be a every avenue we are the, here on the laptop uh, through like uh, any um, communication applications and or on your phone. Scareware. Scareware is where it's like we capture some information, not really like ransomware. Ransomware has a target behind it in terms of monetary pieces. But scareware is like if you don't do something or enter your credentials in the next five minutes, then your system will be locked. Piggybacking and tailgating. This sometimes is uh, a little bit of the physical security realm. They might be following you or doing something. Um, sometimes this is not even a physical thing, right? Like if you go through a door, they don't have a tag, then you know they don't have a tag, but what's the most common thing we do? We hold the door open for somebody, which is a no-no. Yes, we, it's, it's not nice uh, socially, but people are getting in the system, in doors and organizations behind that. But also something over sur shoulder surfing is what we call it too. People that are, if you're in an open space, especially if you're a coffee shop or whatever, people look over your shoulder and you're busy doing something, they'll capture your credentials. And then quid pro quo, which is Latin for this for them. We'll get into that in a little bit. Baiting. What we kind of talked about, right? Terms suggest attacks. Baiting attacks use a fictitious promise to spark a victim's curiosity or a sense of avarice. In order to steal their personal information or infect their systems with malware, they trick users into falling for a trap. That's exactly how it sounds. You, you're baiting somebody, you want a prize. Uh, if you don't do this in the next couple of minutes, you're going to lose your opportunity to, to be part of this. Like the most common thing, and I, I'll say this because I'm a sneaker guy at the end of the day, is that uh, some, some uh, cyber criminals have been very good in using like uh, raffles for certain sneakers or whatever. If you sign up now, you'll get the opportunity to buy this. Or if you put your name and your credentials here, you get an opportunity where, you know, buy a pair of sneakers or even win a pair of sneakers or something like that, right? Easy things, something that they can, one of the things that hackers do, the one of the things I do is reconnaissance, is looking for intelligence. If I've, I have a particular target, I'm going to do the due diligence on my end to figure out what's the, what, what are they browsing? What are they looking at? What are they using? So that way I can appeal to them as a, uh, as a hacker, trying to get into the information for them. Phishing. 
Uh, phishing attackers act as a reliable organization or person in an er effort to get you to reveal personal information and other valuables. This could be like those phishing emails that I told you for the organization. They'll disguise yourself, right? Um, every year for the Navy, I'll tell you, for the Department of the Navy, we have a phishing simulator attack and you have to pass it every single year. And there's like 12 questions. And every year, everybody misses one because it's getting that, to that point, right? Because you can't discern what is real and what's not anymore from your organization. But there's, there's a way to see it, but you really have to pay attention. So be careful. Not, not everything that comes from your organization. I, don't, I wouldn't say that you doubt everything, but also the fact that take the time to look because you're, if you see, oh, okay, Navy or uh, IRS or you know, the Department of California, or whatever, you're going to click on it because you, this familiarity, you think it's repu repu you know, reputable and you're going to click on it and then it's gone. You know, all your information is given to somebody else. Pretexting. At a point that scammer has concocted a tale or pretext that they wish to dupe the victim into believing, just setting the stage. It's a lot of things that you can, a scam that they can pull against you or I can use against anybody. Uh, most of the times it's, it's a scare tactic, right? You're getting something, you're eliciting a fear or, or uh, urgency to get something done in a short amount of time. And that's what drives you, like nobody wants to be pressured. Everybody hates pressure. I don't care if you, anybody says, I, I love working under pressure, I can handle it. No, you can't. I'm gonna tell you, like everybody here has been under pressure, I'm pretty sure hundred percent, but resiliency and everything like that comes at a cost. And the same thing with pretexting, they're gonna get you to believe in something and that's it. You're gonna, you're gonna go hook, line and sinker <laughs> as in this scenario, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to believe it and you're going to go into it and you're going to click on something or push something in there and that's it. So scareware. So next one is scareware, which is, this is a common, common thing. Like I will tell you a lot of our, uh, when we do internal uh, tests within the organization on our people, our, our employees, we use scareware a lot. And it's like a CEO says something, you're, you know, this company CEO needs you to cut, to uh, log him into a system or something like that immediately. And, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to dismiss the CEO if he asks you to do something, but it's bogus, right? But you have a short amount of time and it's, it's pinpointed in certain times of the day and people are not on their toes. Scareware bombards, bombards victims with bogus threats and misleading alarms. Users are tricked into believing their computer is infected with malware, which leads them to install software that either serves only to profit the perpetrator, perpetrator or is malware in and of itself. So basically, it's like if you don't log in in the next five minutes, or if you don't do this in the next five minutes, that's it. You're, you're going to affect the whole system. And a lot of people panic. And though we are so in an age where everybody's so familiar with a lot of um, you know, tricks and threats and everything like that. The, the level of uh, advancement from hackers is extremely good. So don't let Scareware do exactly what it is. Scare you into doing something that you're not comfortable with. Take the time. There's nothing, there's not a bomb going off, guys, right? There's, there's not a life and death situation. So don't treat it as such. And that's the problem where we have right now in most organizations, Scareware gets them to think that it's, if they don't do something, it's the end, the end of their careers. Piggybacking tailgating, like I said earlier, just uh, following somebody, using their credentials to get in. Uh, this is mostly a physical trait, right? Physical security. A hostile actor must travel with somebody who has authorization in order to enter a restricted area or pass through security checks. I can tell you that uh, I have, still being in the reserve, I have a, a top secret SCI clearance and I go into certain rooms for briefings and such. Nobody, everybody's checked multiple times. You're not allowed to piggyback. It doesn't matter if you're uh, the, the uh, five-star admiral of the Navy, you're not following me in. That's the thing. You do not let anybody in. It doesn't matter what rank they hold, what position they hold. At the end of the day, 
if they're not on a private list or they're not part of the organization or they don't have a card to get or a tag to get into the, do not let them in. Being a nice person it will risk, it will cost uh, a lot for you. I mean, you have to follow company procedures. So piggybacking, tailgating, please watch out. Don't hold the door. I'm sorry to say it. Like we're socially polite. Don't do it. And especially for an organization that has high security. Quid pro quo. This for that. Basically what it means. When targets are in need, this tactic is employed. Once a phishing victim has been located, suppose the cyber criminal was looking for a worker who truly required tech support. They attempt to trade sensitive information for their services. That's actually brilliant because if you can get into the system as a hacker, you get in the system, you're going through like different Slack channels, communication channel, which is similar to Microsoft Teams that most organizations use as well. Um, for IT, they hide in the IT Slack channel or the support channel, and they're looking for one person who locked themselves out uh, of a password. And once they find that victim, they, they reply back to them, direct message to them, and then that victim gives them the credentials that they used last time, and then that's it. It takes a little bit of cracking, password cracking on their part, on the hacker's part, but once they get the last password, boom, it's easy day. So some examples of social engineering attacks, phishing emails from a friend or contact, remember, super simple, but God, it's super easy to fall prey to. Social engineer can access the victim's whole contact list after successfully hacking their email or social media account. This is it, social media account, sorry. Guys. The cycle now resumes as the online criminal attempts to access every account on that person's contact list. Once you open that door, what they call opening Pandora's box, everybody's a victim. Your friends, your friends of friends, your family, your family of families. Uh, it's just a, a never ending cycle. So I'm not trying to scare you guys into it, but it's, it's one of those things, right? Uh, phishing emails from trusted sources. Scammers may pose as representatives of banks, financial institutions, whatever, they, like what I said earlier, right? You got a gift card from Amazon. Hey, you got a free sub from, subscription from Netflix, PayPal account, somebody transferred money. To, you're logging in, you're getting numbers, accounts. Uh, you want to get that $5,000 check from, from PayPal that you... Supposedly, you got an uh, uncle in Brazil that's wiring you money. Boom, that's done. So how can you prevent it? What can you do, right? There's a lot of things. One of the main things, read. I'm going to tell you, it's not on here, right? But read the emails. Take the time. Don't rush through things. Don't open emails and attachments from suspicious sources. If you don't know it, if you haven't dealt with it, don't use it. Use multi-factor authentication. Use MFA. So MFA for us is using two things, right? It's something you know, something you have, like your phone. What's commonplace nowadays is a single sign-on point, which is a like an Okta or dual. Um, those pushes uh, auth uh, to make sure that you're the person who you say. And it's also in geolocation. So what you have and what you you have, you know, a phone. So when I log into my my laptop it pushes a verification. The verification I have is physically on my phone. I physically have my phone. So I click on my phone and it authenticates me and tells me, tells the computer, okay, you can log him in because he's valid. But of course people can steal that too. So use that, but also be careful. Keep your, keep your items close to you. Don't lose your phone. And if you lose your phone, have a way to remote wipe it. Keep your antivirus, anti-malware software updated. These are for personal computers. Nowadays, we have an uh, enterprise or companies, you have uh, antivirus and anti-malware, of course, but you have uh, what they call EDRs and EPPs, which are endpoint protection systems and uh, endpoint detection response systems. Uh, it's taking it antivirus and uh, anti-malware to a next level. Uh, some of it actually is built with AI. Um, fantastic uh, what security is doing nowadays. Uh, check for known data breaches of your online accounts. Have that credit monitoring and stuff uh, similar to it. I T-Mobile breach 2020. I was a victim of that. My my social wound up on the dark web. It took hell and high water to get it back and off the dark web. But again, nothing's uh, nothing's 100% um, clear. Right? Don't leave your devices unsecured in public. 
probably protect your laptop and your 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 phone like don't leave it in the car even if you're running into something for five minutes or like the gas station to pay well you know get a drink or whatever don't leave it in your car i take my laptop everywhere not really i mean i could leave it at home but when i am out and i'm traveling from one destination to another i don't take any chances once they steal that laptop or your phone it's done it's very hard to remote wipe it unless you have a, a way to do it use a virtual per, um a VPN. There's many out there. NordVPN, uh, this most common, but use a VPN to protect it. It's tunneling. It makes sure it's encrypted and it's safe. Click uh, keep all network connected devices and services secure. Don't use public. Keep it secure. Hence, use a VPN. And never click on links in any, any emails or messages. You can if you know it is coming from a trusted source and you verify it from that trusted source. There's no way that you're gonna click on something and say, okay, that makes sense, no. So these are some techniques, right? But also it takes some common sense and reasoning as well. These are some guidelines, but as you go through it and you see things that are popping up, because remember, hackers are getting more sophisticated and more so, and hiding it has been very, uh, high on their scale. So some techniques to use. And Johnny, I, I got a question. Yes, sir. As, as you say, a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that, that we learned here today are common sense, you know, no, nothing technical, but there's a lot of common sense. Yes. Sir. What, what level, for, for, but for the technical side of things for <laughs> for two factor authentication, et cetera, to set that up, what level of technical knowledge and understanding does someone need if they want to be on the back end of doing those things? So if your job was creating two-factor authentication systems for a company or doing whatever, yes, sir. It, on a scale of one to 10, what's the technical level for, for, for someone? Um, and, and is it something that people could easily learn without an IT or technical background? So without an IT and technical background, I can tell you from my experience, I had, I, as a procurement guy, I had zero on the technical piece before I moved into cybersecurity, right? And I'm saying, not saying this is a, a, a push for any anything, but uh, one to 10, sir, I would probably say like a six. And that only takes because of knowing the systems and knowing the backends on it. Um, so things that help is Network Plus, Cloud Plus, um, Certified Network Defense Architect, and also Security Plus. Security Plus certification gives you the groundwork in terms of knowing how to set up an MFA. Uh, also the, the parameters behind it. Now the technical aspects of it is something that can be taught. So that's, that's not too difficult, but I'm gonna tell you it does take some certification to understand the complexities of the security concerns behind it. It's nothing but security. They, to be honest, an MFA is an API, and you can you can hook APIs onto anything. It's mm -hmm. it's easy. A manipulation of the code. You don't even have to know, know code, coding language. It's really easy. If I can teach myself, I can definitely teach anybody else. Any anybody in this class can learn for sure. And and there are tasks. <clears throat> it, uh, companies hire people to do some of those to to do the monitoring of some of this common sense. You know the pen testing, et cetera. Yes, sir. And, and a lot of common sense, it's not a tremendous amount of, of skills. It's some skills, but it's, it, it, you, you're not learning nuclear physics. No, sir. Uh, it's not extremely difficult. You're actually, the majority of your time, I, I was a, a SOC analyst, a security operations center analyst. Basically, you're, you're working varying shifts. A SOC analyst, there's different levels, right? A second, a sec analyst, security analyst, you're walking in, you're looking, you're doing research, you're doing uh, log aggregate, you're looking at logs and trying to make sense of, is this a, vulner a vulnerability? Is it a, uh, an alarm? Because what systems that are, are put into the organization's network give, feeds you information. And you're looking at this and verifying, you might have like 70 records per day or during your shift and you're looking at these logs and verifying, okay, is this a, a possible threat? A SOC analyst, on the other hand, 
is take that and that times it by five. A SOC analyst, you're always looking and combing through the systems. And being a SOC analyst is extremely rewarding, but it's extremely tiring sometimes. High, it, the pay is a little bit higher, but also you're not, you're not, the main, the main thing is you're being a detective at the end of the day, really. You're, you know the subset that they've given you, your training, your certifications, you use that, you use the companies has systems that they give you that you're going to be working with. You meld that together. You're looking at this and saying, okay, why is this a vulnerability one week ago that's rated to 3.5, but now it's a 4.7? What happened there? And then you're going through, you're combing through the systems and finding, okay, who's accessing what? And you're finding the culprit or you're trying to stop it. Our job is to really stop it and to call out any deficiencies in our system. Great, great, perfect. Yes, sir. Who's got questions? Who's got questions for Johnny? Before we go into the Kahoot, which is going to be testing you guys at how well you listen to Johnny. Nothing. Uh, All right. Uh, there's okay. one question, Derije. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying you're wrong. Thank you for this wonderful class. I have one question. How can I block scammer email and phone? I'm retired with those things. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. I, I'm happy here. Send me, uh, I'm going to put my email on there. I could send you uh, something before we go into the cohort, cohort, cohorts. Sorry, I'm tired today. But uh, I can send you a, a listing uh, that can block it. So I put my email in there uh, in the chat, everybody. It's jfam at cyberwarrior.com. Email me anytime. Questions about this, anything in life in general, please do. I, I want, regardless of guys. whatever, I want you to be successful. So anyways, uh, let's, let's- No, I, I want to I I follow up on that because it's, it is a great question. They will find ways to send you those emails. Yeah. Just like, just like it, again, I'm going to personalize things. Um, you know, I used to buy a dozen, dozen baseballs at a given time. The minute I bought a dozen baseball boxes of baseballs from Amazon, or the minute I bought a fungo bat, I was getting so many emails from people who had, who, who was, who were monitoring my actions on my, on my computer. These guys do the same thing. They're monitoring what you buy and they're monitoring what you're going to be interested in. And that's where a lot of these emails come from. And so it, it's, it's no different than, 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 the, than the quote unquote social engineering that takes place by a, any online distributor. Yes, so it is, it, this stuff is, it's, it's painful. I mean, you'll never totally get rid of it. If you minimize it, then you have the bandwidth to actually say, hmm, wait a second, um, is, is, this, is this legitimate? And I know I, de I have a happy delete finger and I delete, I delete things that I shouldn't have deleted because they were real, but I just decided, oh, it's scam, you know? And, and it just, you know, my, my brother, who was a very successful guy, just clicked on an email from who he thought was our uncle the other day. Oh wow! Well, my uncle, email, you know, because why don't you? Why don't you? You usually respond to my emails. Why aren't you responding to my emails? Oh, I'm sorry, uncle. Yeah. And you get caught. You know, it just that happens. You know, so it happens to the best of us. The first one, it was really interesting. The first one was, "Hey, why didn't you respond to my email?" Well, sorry, I got it. What do you need? The next day, he got the I need a five hundred dollar gift Amazon gift card sent to me. So it's a process that the social engineering takes place. It's, it's a harmless first email. Yeah, they got you, but they didn't do, they, nothing happened. They just know that you're an idiot. And then all of a sudden they, they hook you. They, they assume you're not paying attention. And he started to pay attention because he told me the story. And I'm like, are you an idiot? What, what are you doing clicking on that? Look at the email, look at the address, come on. Um, you'd fire your employees if they if they clicked on that. What are you What are you thinking about doing it yourself? So anyway, I I, I digress. Isaac, so in social engineering, um, in most of the cases we don't even use any tools, or the hacker doesn't even know uh, use any tools. It's just every day 
on your computer, you receive an email or anything. So we have to be very careful with that. But here it comes the fun part. So um, before we get started, do you guys have heard of the term Kahoot? You know what that is? So it's a platform where we do quizzes um, based on the lessons learning that day. In this case, the what, what Johnny shared to us, which was absolutely out of this world. world you know, so um, we have five questions today, so we are going to take it easy. The point is that we are going to answer it today, um, all of us together. Um, and the thing is that the faster you answer, the right answer, right? The more points you get. So if you have a phone or you wanna use the, the, the website, just go on to kahoot.it. Let's get started then. So, yep, so you're gonna see the question. You just can answer it. Um, you're gonna see the options on there. Yeah, it's just the faster you, you, you answer the correct answer, um, the more points you get. So. Let's just get started. Let me put the music here so we can have a, a good background there. So, all right, start. Good luck, guys. Social engineering. Three, two, and one. So the first question is, it's at this point that the scammer has connected a tale or pretext, pretext that they wish to dupe the victim into believing. So which one is this? <laughs> we we went over this um or Johnny did. Yeah, the answer is actually in the thing. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Pretexting. Pretexting. Yeah. And you have here a little a little trick with the <laughs> tail or pretext. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Next one. So we have Yay Yay and Chris on the top. So let's see. Nice. All right, all right. Second question, multi-select. So these tips can help you become more vigilant about social engineering scams. So you have to select three answers here and click on submit. So select three, then click submit to submit those answers. You see, we have one answer, come on, come on. Remember to hit submit. There you go, we have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of you got it. Right. This is the fun part, just seeing the scoreboard, seeing the battle itself. So let's see. Now, true or false, baiting attacks are fictitious promise to spark a victim's curiosity or sense of avarice. So you just have to select one in this case. Is that statement true or false? Ah. Well done. Right, all right. Yeah, they're looking tough. Ooh. So it's a battle. It's a battle here. Jamal, you got it, Jamal. Yeah. Look at <laughs> all that. All right. Four, it is used to describe a wide range of malevolent behaviors carried out throughout interactions with other people. Come on, this one is easy, come on. Come on. There you go, social engineering. There you go, nice. Right, yeah. Let's see the scoreboard. Woo, woo. Come on, <laughs> it is the last one. It is the last question. So five, it bombers victims with bogus threats and misleading oh. alarms. Wow. We got to make a tough one to end it. So let's see what you guys have for this. All right, there's just one more answer. Three, two, and one. And it is oh most of you got it all right so this is the fun part let's see who wins it here so in the third spot we have Jamal. congrats oh, man cool. second nice. spot we got jj 
Who's the first one? one? Chris. Chris. Wow. And he was really close. He was really, really, really close. So good nice. job there, guys. You guys are outstanding. All right. Yep. So you guys, that gives you a sense of how these things work. Now, again, some of these classes, we get, we get very serious and you need an incredible discipline to get through it. But sometimes you got to take a breath, step, step back and, and figure out what works for you and, and what excites you and what motivates you. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in our program is passion. You got to figure out what your passion is within cybersecurity. This is not like coding. If you're a coder, you know, you're a coder. You, you might use different languages, but you're still a coder. With cybersecurity, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of different career pathways that you can choose. And in a program like ours, you're learning the foundational skills, but you're starting to develop what is your passion within cybersecurity, offense, defense, red, red, blue, purple. It, it really is it's, it's, it's multidimensional and you got to figure out what you really enjoy and what you're good at. And that's what we're going to try to help you to do. And, and, and so the, the key words are discipline, passion, a little bit of fun. But when you do this, and again, this isn't intended to scare anybody, you, you got to show up. You, got, you can't put your laptop under your pillow and think, this is how I'm going to learn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep through and I'm going to, I can go to class two days a week and the rest of the time I'm going to, I'm going to have my head next to my laptop and that's how I'm going to learn. And I just say that because there are some people who try to do that. And I would tell them, don't, don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. Um, but if this is something that you think might be of interest to you, I encourage you to ask some questions about, about the, the process and, and, and what it takes to, to get into our program. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for me or Johnny or Isaac or anybody? My question is, as far as the, the intent, I did, uh, I actually, it was a, a, a a former veteran, uh, I don't remember his entire name, but I, I think his last name was Gunner. And I know he's an advocate for this uh, program. And uh, Gunner he... Kallstrom. Say again? Gunner Kallstrom. That's his yes. name is Gunner. Yes, that's, that's him. That's correct. So yeah. my, I, I guess my question is, at one time, this was supported through uh, the various veteran programs uh, that is no longer supported or is something was still was being, was being worked out. Uh, can you give an update on that? Temporarily, it is not an option to have veterans benefits utilized for our program. We hope that that will change in the first of the year. Um, we, were use, we were working with an educational partner uh, that was based in Boston, um, but they, they were temporarily um, asked not to do online learning by their accrediting body until they demonstrated some more data um, because they had it through COVID protocols, uh, virtual learning. Um, once we um, receive a, or, 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 or sign, sign a partnership with uh, one or more other uh, educational organizations, like you know, two-year, four-year college, whatever, um, then that will be an option again. But right now it is not. And that's why we you know, we're, we're, we're trying to make tuition as, as, as feasible and, 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 and palatable as possible for people. Um, but, but right now you cannot use veterans benefits, but hopefully in the first year you will be able to. Okay. So can you uh, talk to the out of cost pocket that uh, uh, students would pay for the program? We, we have what's called, it's a partnership with a company called LEAF. LEAF is an income share agreement company. Income share agreements are essentially a, a risk-free for you opportunity to take our program. Um, now, I don't, I don't pretend to know what you earn right now for an annual salary, um, nor do I want to know. Um, but an income share agreement with the one that we have, you, the tuition is paid for by an investor. Once you get a job that pays you more than $50,000 a year, then you have, you will start to share that income back with the investor and that will be done automatically out of, from, through payroll deduction. And, 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 you, and you sign some papers to do that. The beauty of it is, again, is that the minimum is $50,000. So, you know, if you're already making $80,000 and you want a, a career change, well, you know, you, they're going to start to draw that money right away because you're, you're making over that amount of money. But uh, or when the when the program is over, 
but a lot of people who take our program are not making, uh, you know, they may be not be working right now. So once you leave the program, if you're not making $50,000 a year, you don't pay a dime until you start earning $50,000 a year. There are 48 months that you can have money drawn out of your paycheck and it's on a percentage basis. So if you're earning $50,000 a year and you took out a, a, a 60,000, or I'm sorry, a, um, if you have a $16,000 tuition, which is the, which is the cost of our, of our tuition, uh, then you would have $521 taken out of your monthly paycheck. Um, would you prefer not to have $521 taken out of your monthly paycheck? Well, of course you would, but it is comparable to what you would pay if you took out a, a, a regular loan from a bank for $16,000. That's, that's about what you're going to be paying. A um, little higher, but not, not much with today's interest rates. Um, so, but again, if you don't earn the 50, um, then you don't pay a dime until you start earning the 50. So it is risk-free, but you will also, with cybersecurity, the chances of you earning a lot more than $50,000 are pretty good if you follow our strategy. Um, so if, let's say you're making $80,000 a year. Well, you're going you're gonna to pay off that $16,000 income share more quickly because the percentage coming out of your monthly paycheck is going to be a little bit higher. But again, a little bit higher means that you're just bringing down that, that, that cap of 20, and the cap is $28,000 over the over the life of that income share so your tuition is 16 and then 1.75 percent of that 16 comes to twenty eight thousand dollars if that makes sense so it's kind of like a loan although it's not really like a loan because if you never pay it back it doesn't impact your your your, your credit score and again a loan a traditional loan well when you're done the program guess what you got to do regardless of whether you're working or not they want you to pay, but that bank wants their money. An income share, you're not required to pay back until you're making that minimum dollar amount. So the 16000 using the LEAF method with the interest rate comes out to a total of 28000 for the courses. At a maximum. It might be less on your situation, but at a maximum, it cannot go higher than that. Okay. It, it was okay. a quote in the chat, so I'm going to fall back and, 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 and let's give somebody else a chance, but uh, I'm not done yet. So. Okay. There was a, a question in the chat, Mr. Edwards, from the oh, uh, Thank you. Let me go to it right here. It says, I have a question about income share. What if I make more than 50 now? Does the payment start now, or how can I manage the situation? So in terms of payments, the payments. in terms... Yes, yeah, sir. the payment would start when you finish the program. The payment would not start until you finish that program, but the but the payment would start at the end. So let's say let's say you were to sign up for our October thirty first class argument for argument's sake. Um, the final day of that class is sometime just shy of Memorial Day. Um, at that point, you would um, start to start to pay back through the income share. Um, assuming you're still making 50. So it's $50,000 regardless of what industry you're working in, um, but it would not be until the program is over. Now, what I would suggest, Chris, in, 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 you know, just not, for, not just for you, but for anybody, the, people, the students who are really diligent here, they start looking for a job at about the three to four month mark in our 28 week program. So it's over six month program. At about three or four months, they start to look for a job, if not before. We start to introduce you to leaders in the cybersecurity field every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, the first week of your program. So you start building your professional networks. You start making those, you know, making sure that you're, you're, you're applying for the jobs that you want to apply for. You're connecting with the right individuals. You're asking for informational interviews. You're asking for, um, for, for networking references. Um, any number of things. You're not always looking for a job to find a job. Sometimes you're looking for help in finding that job. Um, that, that's just job search 101. So but it, there are many people who, if they're studying hard and they're passing their certifications and they're learning our materials uh, and they start to, to, to really take the search seriously and do it in a smart way, they've got a job before the end of the program. And 
everyone who has ever gotten a job, and most people, regardless of, of when they find a job, the average salary in cybersecurity is about $82,000 a year. We've had, and, and, and our most recent placements are right around there. Uh, we've had a couple that have fallen short of, of 70, but not many. A lot of people are in the 70, 75 range. We've had a few people in the 85 to 95 range. We had one person, and that was an outlier that 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 started to make $140,000. But you know, set your expectations. Um, but the point is, is that that a cybersecurity job rarely, if ever, pays only $50,000 a year. Um, so. You, you start to pay back right away, but if, if you do it right, you're going to be in cybersecurity before or shortly after the program is over. And if you're making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, well, you know, the income share, you're making more than you were making before. So would you rather not have it come out? Of course, but it goes, it goes fast and you're, and you're living a better lifestyle than you were living before. And again, I don't know what you're making now, Chris, but that's um, but 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 it's usually a, a, a better opportunity than 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 not doing the upskilling. Um, There's another question, Mr. Edwards. Uh, uh, income share form and ask my SSN and other details. So I just a little bit worried or scared to sign. So I haven't done the income yeah. paperwork, but Mr. Edwards, uh, I if you can give some guidance on that, sir. Yeah, if, if you fill out a loan application, they're going to ask for your social security number. Um, so anytime you're looking for money from someone else, sorry, I don't know why that's going off like this. Um, they're going to ask for your social security number. That's their way to, that's their only way to track. If, 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 if a lender or an investor doesn't ask for your social security number, they have absolutely no way of ever collecting on that debt or return on that investment. So they have to. Um, if you go to a bank to start a bank account, you're going to have to give your social security number. Yeah. Um, so it's it just it's it just the way of the world. Um, but they are also and and trust us when we say that we don't have vendors at Cyber Warrior Academy that don't have the highest degree of cybersecurity practices. Um, <laughs> within their organ, <coughs> excuse me, within their organization. Um, so yeah, it asks for your social security number, but it shouldn't scare you because we give our social security numbers out for any of this kind of, of, of a transaction on a regular basis. If you go to buy a car, you got to give your social security number. You got to give your bank account number. You got to give all those kinds of things because um, they've got to do it. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, like, I'm just re-emphasizing what you said, Mr. Edwards. It's like, so there is a, I'm sorry if I'm saying you're wrong, your name wrong, please apologize, uh, my apologies. But it's just like when you do, like Mr. Edwards said as well, too, they, we vet our suppliers very carefully. We do a supplier risk assessment. So please know that it's it's safe, but it, I would do it. I, I'm going to tell you that honestly. And also it when you do the social security number and all this other information, just like Mr. Edwards says, but when you open a bank account or when you do a car loan or whatever, it tests or it grades your credit worthiness, right? You can have whatever score it may be, but they take that plus your income and other variables to calculate a certain risk score or a score that they use. So I would say uh, you're fine on the income share. I haven't done it myself, but I'm going to tell you that I've done other assessments. And like Mr. Edwards says with Cyber Warrior, Every partner that we work with, we do a, a supplier risk assessment on the back end to make sure everything is correct. So PCI, DSS compliancy, SOC 2, FedRAMP, well, not FedRAMP, but ISO, those are things we look at. So trust me, we're, we're, we're safe on that. You can do that. And, and, and one of the things, and, and thank you for that, for that, for that um, specificity, Johnny. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about, about a, an, uh, an income share is that they, you know, they will check your, your, your background for, you know, if you, if you're in bankruptcy, you're not going to pass it unless the bankruptcy was a result of COVID, then there are exceptions to that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm talking too much. If you have ever defaulted on another income share, meaning you got an income share and then you changed your bank account, you didn't report working, that kind of thing. Um, they're not going to give that to you as well. Or if you are, um, 
if 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 your FICO score is, is somewhere in the 500s, you're probably not going to pass either. Um, but it, it's it's easier to get an ISA generally than a, a traditional bank loan. Uh, Jamal. Yes. Uh, so far as the uh, certifications, uh, are there any certification, industry standard certifications associated with the course? And can you talk to the uh, practical and technical experience that students will obtain from the program? I can. I can. Thank, and thank you for that question. It's something that I should have mentioned. And again, I'm biased. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, but we have a real, we have a program that is a really good bargain. You think about, you know, I know some people who say $16,000 and they choke. We offer three globally recognized certifications. Those certifications are Security Plus, Cloud Plus, and Certified Ethical Hacker. Certified Ethical Hacker alone, the curriculum and voucher alone are several thousand dollars. Add to that Cloud Plus, add to that Security Plus. We're buying you the, the curriculum, we're teaching you the curriculum, and we're also going to buy you the voucher as part of your tuition. So it's not like other programs where they might teach you this stuff, but then, <coughs> sorry. Um, but then they're gonna say, you go buy the voucher yourself. The voucher is already part of your tuition package. So, and those are three certifications. We used to do Network Plus, but there aren't many jobs out there that are requiring Network Plus in the cybersecurity world. If you're in the networking world, of course, Network Plus is a pretty important certification. But in the cybersecurity world, if you did a sub, um, Johnny mentioned um, um, the, a SOC, a SOC analyst. SOC analysts, they're going to ask you to have Security Plus. They're probably, they may ask you to have a cloud, a cloud certification. We just happen to use uh, Cloud Plus because it's very generic. Um, but, but. Those are three certifications that are really important to your foundational learning and, and to the and to the and to the and listed in the job specs. Uh, if you go through Indeed or you go through LinkedIn job search, those are the those are the ones that you're going to see a lot of. You'll see CISSP and 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 some others, but those are the three. Um, and it may not be always Cloud Plus. They you know, they may ask for a, a you know an Amazon Cloud or a, or an Azure Cloud, what have you. Um, so they're all baked in. They're all critically important. They're all universally recognized and 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 awarded uh, credit for, um, and they are a foundational, though not exclusively important, part of our program. We very much believe, and I guess Johnny Johnny's not there right now. I don't know whether whether I scared him off. Um, certifications are important, but they're not all there is. Um, we also teach a number of our own proprietary learning modules. When a hiring manager sits down with you, he or she wants to know that you have the skills to apply right away. There, he or she's going to say, how can you help my team tomorrow? What would you do in this scenario? And you're going to say, well, this is how I would respond because this is what, what I did in my boot camp training. And, and we went through this, this actual lab exercise. Okay. An HR person is going to say, I want to see a cert. I don't care whether you know how to apply the knowledge, but I've got this list that I've got to check and they're going to say, I want the cert. I want to see the cert. So the cert's important to get you in the door for the keyword checks, et cetera. The other stuff's also important. So certs are important. Certs are part of our program, but don't think that that's all that you need because if you just go get security plus by, by yourself without any knowledge of how to apply those skills, a hiring manager is going to see through that in two seconds. Does that answer your question, Jamal? Partially, uh, I, I want to get to the, uh, the the practical and technical experience that that you know to go along with what you what you are saying. So far as the the cert experience, as opposed to the hands on experience that you obtain uh, from the institution. So basically, what type of curriculum you know uh, or hands on experience will the students obtain? within the course, like, you know, are we physically working with uh, Wireshark, MMAP, uh, the various uh, platforms out there for, uh, you know, to 
intercept packets and things of that nature? The, are you actually getting that hands-on experience, asymmetrics? Yeah, sure. yeah, and it's one of the reasons why we have minimum um, specs for the computer you're going to use. Um, you can't do this on a phone. You can't do this on a laptop or on a um, on a on a um, iPad. You you you, you need a, a a computer. You need a, a laptop or a desktop. You can't use a Chromebook. Um, we download virtual machines on a regular basis, so you can do different lab. You can cre we create different lab environments to give you that hands-on experience. Um, Isaac, you want to talk a little bit about the the lab environments that that we we put students through. Yeah, um, so we do all type of lab environments. So, for example, Roger, you were mentioning some tools there, like Wireshark, um, and the ones that Yanni was saying, Nessus, those type of tools, we all do, uh, we all go and put the hands on on them. So, sometimes, you know, the, the tools may be um, low requirements. So, you know, with a simple computer, you can do so, but, but the good ones, which are the majority, they require you to have a good computer. So we can actually take Mac OS because we have applications for them. Um, but as Johnny said, um, there are other uh, machines like um, Chromebooks that they cannot just, uh, they cannot um, go with, into the requirements that we have. So, you know, just going with the uh, minimum amount of A of RAM, um, 500 of hard drive, that should be good, but yeah, we're gonna be putting a lot, a lot of hands on um, into virtualization stuff like that, and that needs that needs uh, good requirements. Isaac, talk about the capstone project. Oh yeah, so also we have some capstone projects that are due monthly, um, and they go from easier and then they get harder as you move on. So the first month of the class actually just getting to know everything, but then. The second month, for example, we have a capstone project where you guys have to talk about a topic for five minutes. So you choose a topic or we assign you one topic and you just talk about it. Um, and it goes to things like that, then all the way into the last project, which, which is just a pen testing activity where you get actually to use the all the knowledge that you gain with all the applications that you gain and you put that all together into finding vulnerabilities of, of a web page. So those are just monthly projects that they will help you build up to what you are learning, you know? So that's how also we can monitor that um, as, well with, uh, as well as with the labs that you guys do and stuff like that. That answer your question, Jamal? Yes. Okay. Um, but again, it's, it's very lab intensive. Um, a college will teach you the academic, the theory, 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 theory. I guarantee you that a hiring manager in a SOC does not care about cybersecurity theory at all. He or she wants to know that if something happens, do you know how to respond? And it's why we have an entire two-week program on incident response. We have an entire two-week program on vulnerability management. We have an entire two-week program on firewalls and IDPS. We give four weeks to certified ethical hacking. We give two weeks to malware analysis. We give two weeks to packet analysis. These are all lab-driven um, elements of our program that will give you the hands-on so that, again, you know how to, how to, what, what, what it takes to be a value-add to a cybersecurity team on day one. And now again, no one's going to be 100% of a value add to a cybersecurity team on, on day one, but you'll you'll be able to help. You'll have to go through more training, et cetera, to, to fit the needs of that individual organization. But it is about the lab. It is about these virtual machines that we, 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 we put in place. Sometimes the virtual machine will talk about uh, a, a threat on, on Windows 10. Another time it'll talk about um, some, other, some other system because not everyone, not every company, not every individual is using the same hardware. So you need to know how to respond to different types of hardware. Um, it, yeah. is, it is lab and hands-on ex uh, extensive. And Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, <coughs> just as Jonathan was saying, um, not in, it's not also only just about the labs, but the labs that we provide. 
um, because they are really, really, really hands-on um, and like goes to what a real-time environment you will like you will be doing at a job base. So the lab we're doing is how they are going to be when you get to a job. So they will get you the experience of not only when everything works, but when everything also not works. You know, we're going to be doing a lot of troubleshooting. Um, and that happens a lot in this field. You really, really have to be ready for just troubleshooting whenever the system is not ready um, or it's not running how it, how it should and stuff like that. So this lab really, really uh, works in those aspects to get you fully, fully ready. One of the, one of the cool things that, and, and it's something that I, that I learned in, in, in doing this, we used to get students who would sort of want to take their bat and ball and go home when something didn't work in the lab environment. Um, and someone brought it up in a career ambassador event one night. And the speaker, and, and our career ambassador events, and I want to talk a little bit about them, but they're, they're high-level CISOs. We've had the CISO from Eli Lilly, which is the 13th largest company in the country. I mean, we've had, we, we just had the, the, the head, of, head of global cloud security from Microsoft a couple weeks ago. I mean, these people are, are serious. And I forget who the speaker was. But they were saying, well, you know, sometimes the, the the lab environment doesn't work. And how do you how would you deal with that? And they were kind of, you know, this life isn't fair kind of kind of commentary. And the person said, do you think that the systems that we set up in our operation center work 100 percent of the time? And and I got to tell you, if one of my employees complained that something happened because the system wasn't set up correctly, they wouldn't last very long. You've got to know how to adapt. You got to know how to pivot when something doesn't go right. That's cybersecurity. You know, the it took it took months and months and months for the people trying to fix solar winds to fix solar winds because they were looking for something that had been installed yesterday. It had been installed two years prior. It was software that was purchased and they plugged it in and it's fine, et cetera, et cetera. And the people who, who, who wrote the, the malicious code, they waited about two years before they launched that code. That's patience. I don't know any other criminal element that has that kind of patience. You go rob a bank, guess what? You're getting the money right then. They took they, two years and the people didn't know what to do and they couldn't figure it out because they were looking in the wrong places. And if, if one of the people had said, yeah, but it's not supposed to work this way, this isn't working. Well, that's, that's because they're pretty smart people who, who, who did the code. Um, so that's the cool thing about what we do. We, we, we put you through a number of different scenarios and sometimes those scenarios are going to work and sometimes they're not going to work. And you got to figure out how to, how to adapt and, and, and pivot and, 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 and fix it. Um, and that's more than just theory. That's practical application. 